Welcome everybody to this online service on Sunday the 15th of November. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning and I hope uh, that you're well. My name's Ben, if we haven't met before, I'm the Vicar of Maresfield and Nutley Churches and I'm here in St Bartholomew's in Maresfield today recording this service and uh, I'd love it if you were all here uh, but we're waiting for that day when we can return and uh, let's hope it's not too far away. Our theme today is actually about waiting and being ready as uh, we continue with the set readings for this Sunday, working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, through a section which is very much about what it means for Jesus to come back and what it means to be ready for him. And we'll see today that being ready for Jesus means that he will find us doing something in particular uh, when he comes back. We're going to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to hear God's word read. But before I introduce the first uh, few parts of our service, let's just pause and be quiet, acknowledging that even though we are at home, uh, our Heavenly Father is, of course, with us, even there, and he wants to be at work in our lives today. Let's just pause for a moment and prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you that we can gather in this way and we pray that you would bless us, that you would minister to our hearts and help us to love your Son and to understand more clearly what it means to be ready for his return. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to begin by learning a new song by a band called Awesome Cutlery, and we've had some of their songs before. This one is about Jesus coming back. It's called Jesus is, is Coming Back, and um, uh, I really like this song. Uh, so do listen to it first time round. If you feel you pick it up quickly, sing along at home. If you're, if you're younger and you have an instrument around the place, grab it and play along if you like. We're going to sing this song, then we're going to meet a new friend of Jesus, and we're going to have our Bible reading and go straight into our sermon. But first, let's, let's sing. Jesus is coming back. taken away No more sin or darkness Every wrong made right Jesus Christ is coming and he is the light He's coming back again because he promised to Celebrations when we see our King 
When you need a snack, who do you ask? A family! Oh, me! George Mueller knew that the best person to ask when he needed anything was his friend Jesus. George was born in Germany but came to England to tell people about his friend Jesus. He wasn't paid money and he never asked anyone for money. He asked Jesus to give him what he needed and Jesus did. George set up schools for boys and girls so they could learn to read and write and find out about his friend Jesus. He asked Jesus to give him the money that he needed, and Jesus did. George set up homes for boys and girls with no families. He asked Jesus to give him the money that he needed, and Jesus did. One day, George prayed for food for the children. The doorbell rang. Ding dong! Who's there? Who is it, Robin? It was the baker. He wanted to give him bread for the children. The doorbell rang again. Ding dong! It was the milkman wanting to give them milk. George looked after thousands of children. They always had food. They always had clothes. They even had enough money to give away to people who needed it more. George asked Jesus to help him with food, money and clothes. Even when the drains and holes in the roof too. And he did. George knew that Jesus always looks after his friends. The reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. The parable of the three servants. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well, good. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. 
If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and then they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have, have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today we're continuing through the Gospel of Matthew. We looked at some of Matthew 24 a couple of weeks ago, and today we're looking at part of Matthew 25. And the theme is the same. It's all about being ready for when Jesus returns, for that day when Jesus returns. And today we're going to see that being ready for Jesus is being found serving Jesus in this life. And I'll explain more about what I mean as we go. There are lots of things in life to get ready for, and, and usually getting ready for someone or something doesn't mean just sort of standing around. Uh, I always remember growing up when my grandparents were coming to visit. You knew they were coming, because if, you, if I woke up on one of those mornings, in fact, even if my parents hadn't told me they, weren't, they were coming, I'd probably know. Our house was always tidy, but it would be especially clean. There'd be an outfit laid out for me, normally a nice uh, ironed blue shirt. I'd come downstairs and Nat King Cole would be playing. My mum would be preparing food in the kitchen. My dad would be moving the car off the drive so my grandparents could park there and wouldn't have so far to walk. Now, to be ready for my grandparents' arrival was not just to, to look out the window, as I probably did but to be serving them in advance, if you like, of their arrival by pre being prepared and ready for them. Well, again, we see in this passage that being ready for Jesus' return is not about just standing around and waiting, or maybe even not caring, or giving it a moment's thought. But those, to be ready for Jesus in this passage... To be ready for the arrival of his kingdom in full is to be found serving King Jesus and his kingdom now. I just wanted to start by explaining a little bit about what the kingdom of God actually means. Here it says the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes it's called the kingdom of God. Uh, it's the kingdom of Jesus. A kingdom implies a king, doesn't it? Our queen uh, rules over this country and a few other territories. And you could say that was her kingdom where she exercises her power, but importantly, where her authority is recognised. Now, in the Bible, of course, we know that, that Jesus is, in one sense, the king of the whole world because he made the whole world. But it's also true that not all of the world acknowledges him as their saving king. So in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is established and grows as people acknowledge Jesus as their saving king. And importantly, to, to, be, uh, have, to have in our minds as we think about this parable is the fact that Jesus came once and established that kingdom, calling people to follow him, calling people to acknowledge him as their saving king. And of course, he then left to go back to be with heaven uh, and will one day come back to fully complete and establish that kingdom. And in the meantime, he has wonderfully entrusted his church with the work of, with his help, continuing to grow that kingdom, which grows every time someone acknowledges Jesus as their saving king. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, we're talking about wherever Jesus sits acknowledged as that saving king. So Jesus says in this parable, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He's a wealthy man, not sure what he did, but he's wealthy. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. 
he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities, he then left on his trip. This is incredible. This is a, a wealthy individual who has decided to generously entrust his servants with his wealth, with his, his treasure. And we see that their task is to acknowledge that responsibility and to then invest what he, they have been given to see that treasure grow. And I think that treasure here is supposed to get us thinking about the kingdom of heaven. I think the master going away is Jesus, who's gone away, but entrusted his church to continue doing the work, that precious work of growing the kingdom. And I think the treasure may well be the treasure, because elsewhere in the Gospels, the kingdom is likened to a a treasure hidden in a field that's found and you sell everything to have, or again, a, a pearl of great price that you give up everything to have. The kingdom of God is described as the most precious thing that we can have, that we can be a part of. It's precious because it's Jesus' kingdom, but it's also precious because it was opened up for us and established through the death of Jesus, God's own precious son. There is nothing greater that, that God could have given in order to open the way. So for those of us who are part of that kingdom, who know Jesus as our saving king, we know how glorious and precious Jesus is and how glorious his, his, and precious his kingdom is too. And so I think here the master again is to help us to be mindful of the fact that Jesus has gone and entrusted us with the work of building his precious kingdom. And as part of that, he has given us everything we need in order to see that kingdom grow. To serve him as we wait for him to return. How do they, return, how do they respond? Well, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. And the servant with two did the same and got two more. Strangely, the third servant with one bag just put it in the ground. And we'll, we'll think more about him later on. Now, the language in this translation doesn't pick up necessarily everything about how those first two servants responded. The language here is that they got on with it immediately. There's a sense in which they knew just how important this work was, how precious this work was. There's a, they have a real respect and, and love for their master that means that as soon as he's gone, they get on with the work straight away. The work of wanting to see that treasure multiply, to see the kingdom of God grow, investing themselves. And the idea of investing here is, you know, investment is always a risk, isn't it? That they are prepared to take risky, bold steps uh, in order to see the, the kingdom grow, to see people uh, come and know the Lord Jesus. And by his grace, their treasure multiplies. But what about the, the, uh, the third individual with one bag? Well, they just put it into the ground. And already we might be wondering, why on earth have they responded like that? It shows a, a real unwillingness for some reason to engage in the work that the, the master has given them to do. But again, what, what are we seeing here in those first two servants? Well, I think we're seeing a model of discipleship. Those who have made Jesus their saving king will recognise him as as their loving Lord. And to have received the kingdom of God is to have received something so valuable. It's forgiveness, everlasting life, hope for the future, being with God. It's such a precious thing that, that why wouldn't we want other people to have that too? No, the first two individuals here, the first two servants, are a model of discipleship, a, a keenness, a willingness to use what they have been entrusted with to grow it, to see the kingdom grow. It's interesting, isn't it, that one has five, one has two, one has one bag, but 
each, even one bag of silver then was incredibly valuable, a great treasure. And in the kingdom of God, there, there isn't, um, uh, so the economy of God, it's not, it's not the same throughout, is it? Some are entrusted with certain things, some are entrusted with other things, all incredibly precious. And maybe we find that during our lives, our capacity is up here, and other days it's down here, it's up here, it's down here. But what's important is the master knew their abilities, and, he's, he's, he never, and Jesus never asks us to do more than he knows that we can cope with. He never gives us more to do than he has equipped us to handle. And so there will be times in life where we feel like we can do a lot, and times when we feel like we can only do very little. But whether large or small, it's both precious work to serve the Lord Jesus, and he will, I believe, equip us to do that work. We're then told the master returns. We're told here that he returns in verse 19 after a long time, a clue perhaps that Jesus was never going to return quickly. There would be a delay or a time of waiting. And he's coming back for them to give an account of how they've used his money. Now this passage is challenging us about how we're going to use our life, use our time in the present as we wait for Jesus to return. Because he's going to ask us to give an account of the way we lived. And look how he responds to the servants who had five and two invested and grew the amount of uh, silver treasure they had. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. No, the master says, because you've shown uh, you've been faithful with this small amount, I'm going to give you so much more. And in fact, you're going to enter now into my joy. Let's celebrate. And again, remember, the master returning is, I think, supposed to be about Jesus returning. So I think he's talking about the, the life that is to come the new heavens, the new earth. No, he's saying, because you have been faithful in doing kingdom work in this life, you can continue to serve me with even more things in the next, and it's going to be full of joy. I think the responsibilities and joy of the kingdom that is coming, the life that is beyond this one, uh, it will be full of even more joy than the present. Those who are found loving and serving Jesus, investing themselves in this life for him, will find that the kingdom is theirs forever. But what about that servant with just one bag who hides it in the ground? What happens? Well, his response to the master's return is striking. He says, Mark, verse 24, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. What a striking response that is. He actually, what a warped view of the master. He says, actually, I didn't do it because you're not very nice. So I just hid it here, you can have it back. Does he really believe that about the master? I don't think he does. Because the master replies, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Now the master is saying, well, if you really thought I was that harsh, at the very least, you'd have put the money in the bank and put your feet up and then drawn it out with the interest uh, and brought it to me so that at least you could say that you would earn me some more. Sometimes when we abdicate our responsibilities, when we are found out, uh, sometimes, sadly, our response can be, well, I would have done it if you were like this or if you had done that. We throw it back at the other person to try and get ourselves off the hook. It's clear here that this third servant had no interest in serving his master, but when his master returns, instead of apologising, throws it back at him and says, well, it's your fault. Or here are my excuses for not serving you as I should have done. 
But the master has none of it. He doesn't accept this excuse. And tragically, he then tells him to take away this servant's silver. And instead of saying that you can become part of the uh, of what is to come, they are thrown out into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now those first two servants were invited into the joy of their master. The third is thrown into darkness and excluded from what is to come. And I wonder who this person represents. Well, it's someone obviously who, who doesn't love their master and who doesn't recognise the precious nature of the of what they have been entrusted to do. They don't recognise that to grow their master's uh, wealth is a good thing. So in Christian terms, I think we have someone here who clearly knows about Jesus, who clearly has been given an insight into the kingdom of God, but has no interest in serving serving Jesus or seeing the kingdom grow. They don't recognise its value really. And in the end, when Jesus returns, they make their excuses. Wonder what excuses that person might make. Well, I never had time. Um, I didn't really like what you said. Um, I didn't really want to go and tell people about you. It doesn't, doesn't feel like the right thing to do. What excuses might we make? Whatever excuses we make, it's clear that to be aware of the kingdom and not to respond uh, to Jesus and to want to see that precious kingdom grow is to act terribly before Jesus. What this passage reminds us is that sin is not just about the things we do that aren't right, but the things that we don't do that we should and need to repent of. Let me be very clear about what this uh, sermon is, is not about and what this passage is not saying. Those who know me will know that I will go on and on and on about the fact that the Bible tells us that to be made right with God is through grace and faith alone. Jesus has already done everything so that we can have a right relationship with God forever. We just need to believe. The thief on the cross next to Jesus at Easter could do nothing to earn his way into paradise, to heaven. All he could do was believe. But the thing is, for those of us who have a bit more time than the thief on the cross, there is a a calling here that reminds us that true faith, a true love uh, for Jesus, a true recognition of the precious nature of the kingdom of God will show itself in kingdom living in loving Jesus and in loving others by wanting to use everything that we've received and helping others to become part of that too. To serve the precious kingdom of all that God has given us. That shows a true and lively faith. It's not about being perfect. None of us are perfect. But wherever we find ourselves, whatever we're doing, whether our capacity is high or low, whether our opportunities are great or very small, I believe what this passage is calling us to do is to have deep down inside a love for the Lord Jesus that says, yes, I want to serve you now. I want to see your kingdom grow because I know how precious it is. I know what I've received and I want others to receive it too. And if you don't have that love, and I admit that even in the best of us, that's, I'm not, that's not about me. I'm just saying that even the most faithful of persons can have good and bad days. But at the end of the day, what is it you long for? And if you don't long to see people come and know Jesus as their saving king, then maybe you need to examine your heart and ask yourself whether you've really trusted in, in Jesus, really grasped the precious nature of his kingdom. And don't worry if you realise that you never really have. It's never too late for you to say sorry and to ask God by his spirit to help you to live a new life. Maybe you're someone who's aware that in days gone by you felt like you were really going for it, but now you just find your opportunities so limited. Don't be afraid of that either. Remember you're saved by faith alone, through grace alone. Just ask, ask Jesus to help you to serve him in whatever way you can in that moment and know that that is precious to you. 
And for all of us, let's, let's pray that we would love Jesus, love his kingdom, and that when he returns, he would find us serving him. Because it's clear here, isn't it, that those who are found building the kingdom in this life, by the grace of God, will enjoy that kingdom forever. Well, we're going to have a time of prayer now and begin as we, we do at, this, at the moment with a time of confession. An opportunity for us, as always, to be honest with God, to acknowledge before him our, our lives and the, the times in which we haven't loved him and honoured him as we should. And, and today maybe you're feeling that perhaps you are just sensing that you haven't offered yourself to God in the way in which you know you should. Maybe there are times when you know that you have stepped back from doing something that you believe God was calling you to do. Well, this is an opportunity for us to acknowledge that to him and to be assured that because we're trusting in the work of Jesus that we are forgiven so as always in a moment there'll be some words on the screen and and this confession prayer there's a there's a response at the end of each section which reads save us and help us which if you'd like to you can join in uh, and say with me god our father we come to you in sorrow for our sins for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. 
Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we now continue with a time of prayer. Let us now pray. Dear Father, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, our refuge and strength and present help in troubled times, we come before you today to humbly pray. Just this past week, the online remembrance services have given us all an opportunity to reflect upon all the men and women who made sacrifices for the freedom we enjoy today. God of truth and justice, we hold before you all those who have died in active service. We honour their service and cherish their memory. Lord, we put our faith in you for the future, for you are the source of life and hope, now and forever. Amen. Dear Lord, we give you thanks today for both churches of Nutley and Maresfield and for our wider church family. We pray for our vicars, Ben and Pauline, and for their families. Keep them safe, and by your Holy Spirit, refresh them daily with renewed strength. We give thanks for all who quietly and diligently take care of the various church business, the buildings and the churchyards. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, thank you for your word in the parable from the Gospel of Matthew today that teaches us that it is not simply a story about money, but also about how God expects us to use our gifts and wisdom to grow his kingdom on earth. It is easy to look at others, such as a minister, an artist, a doctor or musician, as we can clearly see their gifts we automatically assume they have something special to offer to God. But what about the rest of us? What do we have to offer? Father, you give each one of us a gift, though some gifts might not be as obvious as others. The key is for us to recognise your gift and use it for the good of others. Help us not to hide any of these gifts that you give, and certainly we should not try to bury them like the fearful third servant. Dear Lord, help us not to be afraid, or unwilling to share the gifts that you generously bestow upon us. Let us not make excuses why we can't, or won't. Dear Father, give us the courage and strength to pray with wisdom, and come to know what your desire is for each of us. Let us yearn to be like the first and the second servants in the story, eager to use wisely what we have been given. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us give thanks today for all the scientists and medics around the world who have powered onwards and upwards, using their knowledge and wisdom in research and testing. Let us give thanks to all the volunteers who have received the trial vaccines. Their selflessness is refreshing. Let us pray that everyone who now receives the new vaccine 
will remain well and healthy and that people's lives may be restored to some kind of normality as we know it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray for our government. 2020 has undoubtedly been a very difficult year. Dear Father, may your divine power be upon all those in power who make important decisions that affect our nation. Father, give them the clarity and the wisdom, and we pray that any decisions taken are purely for the good of all throughout the United Kingdom and the wider nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father God, in this second lockdown, COVID-19 continues to bring loss and sorrow to many and still some uncertainty. We lift up all those who are struggling once again, or indeed struggling with fears of debt and job insecurity, and many are feeling totally bereft, often unable to see their family and friends. Dear Lord, bring your healing comfort to those we know suffering insecurities for their future, and for those suffering with any mental distress. Lord, bring them your peace, so they may feel their troubles eased and calmed, and a sense of hope be with them in the coming days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we lift those known to us today who are sick and suffering at this time. Let us just pause for a moment and bring to mind those that we love and care for who are unwell. Father, we ask that you be beside them in their desolation. Be comforter to all who are sick and suffering, and most especially in times of pain, fear and distress. Guide their doctors and nurses throughout every step of any treatment. May your Holy Spirit be with them to remove all fear, to relieve any discomfort and to heal and restore and to bring a great sense of peace. As we gather up all our prayers to you today, Father, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, before we sing our final hymn, just one or two notices for you. Um, obviously, we're expecting at this time uh, for us to be back in church uh, in December after the, the lockdown is lifted on the 2nd of December. I'm really hopeful that we'll have clear guidance well before that time arrives. So uh, stay tuned and when I know things, I'll pass them on to you. Likewise, if you know anything, feel free to pass it on uh, to me. Thank you so much to those of you who've uh, said you'd like to be involved in the Advent readings through December. I've got a nice sort of handful of people and I think that we'll probably have two or three readings um, between us throughout December. If you'd like to be involved in that, um, please do let me know. Uh, send me an email and I'll be glad uh, to include uh, you in that. As I mentioned in my letter to both of the churches, you'll know that we do have plans for Christmas and um, we have some ideas of what we'd like to do and we're doing our best to, to try and put those plans into action. Of course, it all very much depends on what the government decide we're allowed to do in December. So we're, we're keeping on our toes, um, but uh, hopeful that we can open our churches in some way or at least broadcast something out that will be an encouragement to us at Christmas. But whatever happens this Christmas, I hope and pray for all of us that are the focus of our hearts will be on the baby Jesus and why he came. And, and this year very much I'm hoping to, to, to reflect on the fact that Jesus came for everybody and that theme of, of his humble birth uh, means so much for us. 
tells us so much about what he is like. Uh, So whatever happens this year, I hope that we'll have an opportunity to reflect on that and that uh, all of us will cherish uh, the baby Jesus, King Jesus, at this time of year. Once again, thanks so much for joining us uh, today online. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. And I'm going to finish uh, this time together with a prayer for us. Father, we thank you that you have promised that your son Jesus will return. And we thank you that when he returns, he will complete his kingdom building work. And we thank you that by trusting in him, by making him our saving Lord, we know that we are part of the kingdom that is to come. And so we pray that you would ready our hearts, that we would love you and be willing to serve you, that we would be willing to take godly risks for you. 
Now this time especially, we pray that you'd show us how we can be obedient to your call to do the work of the kingdom wherever we find ourselves and with whatever capacity we find that we have. May we know your blessing and strength and grace. And with that, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. God bless and bye for now.